Okay, well, welcome to today, all four of you. I'm going to do this to shame the ones that didn't come in, because I'm sure there's at least another three that could have made it. Um, yeah, four out of 106. You're the tough ones. I thought there were half of you live in residence. <laughs> Actually, there's at least 12 of them in here live in residence, so I don't know why they're not here. Yay, two. Residents? Three. You're the only external person. Congratulations. Okay, anyways, um, this is the lecture you guys were supposed to have after the break um, because you were supposed to take a midterm today. Obviously, that got canceled uh, because of the storm yesterday. Um, so this is the lecture for after. It's, uh, it's a little bit long, but I'll try to get through it at a fair decent pace. Um, maybe I'll just do a quick review uh, bef before the midterm. I don't know yet. We'll see. All right. Today's lecture is about the Linux file system. A file system is a collection of directories and files. Just like in Windows where you've got directories and files, Linux has directories and files, a Mac OS has directories and files, that is a file system. Essentially, the file system maintains um, where your stuff is contained. Um, now, each file system doesn't have to exist on a single hard drive. That's one of the cute tricks with uh, Linux, even Windows. If you rate, you rate multiple drives, you can actually spread a file system across multiple disks. On the other way around, you can also split up a disk into multiple file systems. This is becoming less common than it used to be. Um, there once was a time where you actually had a limit of how big a file system could be, and you had a bunch of small file systems to make up for it. Or, by the same token, hard drives weren't you know, measured in terabytes. They were measured in megabytes. And even a, you know, a 20 megabyte drive was considered big. That would have been 1992, 1993. My friend had a $2,000 computer with a 20 megabyte drive. Think about that. You know, my, my phone takes pictures that are bigger, bigger than that. That's what, three pictures on most phones. Um, so, you know, things have changed. So, in Linux, most file systems in Linux use something called inodes. So that's something that Windows file system does not have. The inode is identified by a unique number called the inode number. So you guys have taken database. You know what a primary key is. Essentially, inodes are essentially the primary keys for files. The, although there's no SQL to access your file system, each file has a unique number. And it's sequential, essentially. It just grows and grows and grows. Every time a file gets created, it adds an inode. Um, Every Linux file system, when you first create it, even if it's an empty drive, it's got a big pile of inodes available. It basically allocates a big chunk of numbers. It guesses on the number of inodes it's going to need based on the size of the file system. So whenever your file gets created, it grabs a single inode, assigns it to that file, and the inode itself gets an, empt an empty number. So basically there's a slot, the number gets assigned, it's gone. Um, and then when the inode, when the file gets deleted, it removes its inode, gives the number away, and it marks that this inode is now empty. So a bit like in Windows where you have, uh, not Windows, but DOS, um, back in the DOS days, we had something called the fat table, file location table. And whenever you deleted a file, all that would happen is the file didn't get deleted, it just got marked as no longer there. Linux is much the same. It would allocate an inode to identify a file. If the file's been deleted, it says this inode is now empty. Congratulations, there's nothing there. And once you run out of inodes, guess what you can't do? You can't add any more files to the file system. You gotta start deleting so that the inodes become available once again. So it's entirely possible to have, you know, a terabyte drive, which really isn't that big anymore, but you know, a terabyte drive with lots and lots of inodes, but you have a, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of 1K files. Suddenly, you know, the drive is only 25% full, but it's run out of inodes, and then suddenly you can't access, add files anymore because you ran out of inodes. So there's a file on the file system called the inode list. It's a hidden file. You're not allowed to play with it. Uh, inode numbers are specific to a single file system, so every file system you create gets a, its own inode file. And the inode list basically 
you know, contains is unique to each file system. So even if you have one drive with three partitions, each partition get its own, gets its own inode list. Um, and you can see what the inodes are by running ls i. So if I go, no, wrong one. Just go show how often I actually run that command. So you'll see a list of files here with a bunch of numbers. Uh, just to make it a little easier to read, I'll add the L to it. Now you guys have, have seen this layout before, but normally the permissions are the first thing on the left. And now you can see instead of the permissions on the left, it's a number. That's the, that's the file's magic number. It's inode number. And as you can see, they are all different numbers. They seem to be pulled off from all over the place. However, uh, you can see that certain numbers seem to be uh, close to being sequential, depending on what's happening. And every time, while you're working, the operating system is obviously doing stuff in the background. And it's using up inode numbers and releasing inode numbers. So the inode numbers look like they got just rolled out of a random number generator. They're not, but they look like it. All right, continue back to the Linux file system. Um, now, a file system is a logical means for the OS to store and retrieve data available on the different mediums that I've covered already. Um, you can create, move, delete files, which you guys have already learned in lab three, which is touch, make directory, copy, you know, move, remove directory, and remove file. Uh, modifying file names, MV. Uh, if you were, if you started doing the um, hybrids, you might have started working with Vim, uh, since there's three or four hybrids for Vim. Uh, to use that to edit files. Uh, you can search file for files using find and other ones using grep, and obviously ls to list the contents. We're actually going to learn about find and grep later in the term. Uh, they're a little more uh, difficult. Now, those functions I just described are basic to pretty much all operating systems. Each OS, however, does it differently. Um, even the file systems that you choose to use will do it differently, and it'll effect, impact how effective the file system is. For example, FAT was notoriously bad for getting corrupted. Uh, anybody ever take um, a memory card out of camera, plug it into your computer, and then rip it out without unmounting it? Same thing with a flash drive. And, you know, you pull it out, and the file system isn't finished being finalized, and whoop, you lost files, or suddenly you plug it in again, and so Windows says, hey, there's something wrong with the flash drive. Yeah? Yeah, well, theoretically, there once was a time where a lot of hard drives and big computers were actually in, in racks, and you could just pop a key and pull it out. And, you know, you could toast it. And fi FAT systems are notorious for that. Uh, Linux... Um, is similar. It's got issues. Um, there's different file systems that mitigate some of these issues. Um, however, in Linux, file concept is simple. A uh, file is a sequence of bytes that are identified with an address. Where's the address? It's contained in the inode list. So essentially, in the inode list, you've got a number and then an address, a physical address of where it is on the disk. Uh, everything is treated as a file. Network cards, hard drives, your keyboard is treated as a file. So whenever the operating system is pulling your keyboard for your keystrokes, it's actually reading the, it's basically reading the contents of a file constantly, nonstop. And that's how it's actually getting your input. Um, output devices also, such as printers, and those of us that are past certain age will remember modems. And the modems would, you know, you'd, they're serial devices, and you'd communicate using serial ones. Those of us that were old enough actually remember doing these strange things. Now, although we did discuss the file system a little bit earlier in the term, um, quick review, it allows any number of files and directories under the root file system, organized any way you want. It's arranged like a tree. The root is always slash. And this is just an example of a tree structure there. However, there's a few predefined folders every Linux operating system has. And these also tend to apply to Unix-like operating systems. 
and Unix operating systems. So if ever you've heard of BSD or FreeBSD, or all those poor Mac users out there, which is basically FreeBSD that's been rebadged, um, which is why it's unfortunate that Mac OS has been so neutered usability-wise, because below the hood, it's actually a really good OS. It's just, you know, they've taken a really good OS and they dumbed them down as far as they could go. Um, these are some of the pre-canned directories you'll find in all these operating systems. Root, which is slash. Slash root, that's the root's home u root user's home directory. Uh, slash bin, where are all your commands? The most essential ones, these are the CDs, the LS, uh, CPs, all in there. S these are programs that are usually used for administrative secured bin or safe bin. Uh, these are the ones where the root user tends to use, such as mounting file systems, creating new file systems, that kind of stuff. Slash boot, that's where the kernel <coughs> and anything that's used during the boot process is contained. It used to be really common to put, put the boot folder in a separate uh, partition so that it was isolated from the rest of the operating system. Nowadays, it's all on one. Uh, slash dev, these are all your devices are. So if you're trying to access... Um, your hard drive directly, yeah, there's a file, file, under the dev directory. Same thing with the printers. Uh, there, if you had an old style serial printer, like back in the day, though well, everybody in this room is probably too young except for maybe one of us, to not rem maybe two might remember what a serial printer was. Well, I'm just trying to be nice. Um, Gray hair is not an indication of age, or lack thereof. Um, but yeah, there's old parallel port printers and the old serial port printers. And essentially, you could actually open it up by dev slash uh, sr1, I think it was. And literally, it'd be the first serial device, or sr0 would bring you your first serial device. It's kind of cool. Other directories that are very important, slash etc. That's where the system contains its configuration. In Windows, those of us that are a little more adventurous would probably open up our registry. If you've never done that, don't do it unless you know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, you want to learn how, go read before you try to do it. Um, but essentially in Windows, we have something called the registry, and that's where 90% of the operating system's configuration is contained. Most applications contain their stuff in the registry, although there's starting to be a move away from that, so make the applications easier to move around. Um, but ETC contains configs for everything. VAR. VAR has the administrative files, um, such as log files, um, data files. For, for Since we've all used Postgres, on Linux, Postgres tends to contain its data directory somewhere under VAR. Uh, if anybody here has ever run a web server, um, or those of you taking the web dev course have probably played with... Uh, XAMP. Under you'll have a C XAMP HD Docs folder. Under Linux, it's usually under var triple w. Um, home, guys, you know what the home directory is by now. If you don't, you haven't been doing your labs. Uh, lib. Libs are where your libraries are needed to run other programs. Um, in Windows, this is pretty much System Thirty Two. Uh, it's basically all your DLLs. If ever you've tried to launch a program and it says you're missing a DLL, or you've launched another program and it says your DLLs are, are corrupt or you know wrong version of the DLL, same idea. Lib. Um, proc is the interface between the file system and running processes. So there's a magic folder where every program that's running, if you if it wants to make itself available to other programs, will create a file in there, and you can actually use that file to talk from one program to another program. It's kind of cool. Uh, file names. Files are allowed to have 255 characters, just like Windows. Um, however, the big difference is it doesn't care about the path. In Windows, 255 characters has to include the path. So if you go C backslash program files, it counts program files as part of your file name. Under Linux, it doesn't count. So you have 255 characters for the whole file name plus the path to get to it. Um, 
you can use any pretty much any character you want. There's a few you probably shouldn't. Um, you should avoid spaces. Under Windows, people have gotten used to putting in spaces in all their files. Uh, same thing with Mac, because uh, the OS is hiding from the fact from you that it's actually difficult to deal with. Um, in Linux, if you insist on using spaces, especially if you're working command line, you have to put quotes around the file name, so like double quotes. So quote space name space is space dan close quotes. Otherwise, it thinks you're dealing with files called my name is Dan. So it thinks you're working with four files because he uses as a space as a file name delimiter. So if you want to use spices, you have to use quotes. Um, the other choice, the other one that's challenging is backslash. Why? Because it's an escape character. I don't know if you guys have learned about escape characters yet in other courses, uh, but backslashes are escape. Guess what you have to do if you want to put a backslash? Double backslash. You gotta escape your backslash. You're causing yourself grief. And the last one I tend to not recommend, even though it's not listed on this, is forward slash. Why? What's the directory separator in Linux? Did you know in Windows you can't use a backslash as a as a character in a file name? Same reason you can't use a colon either. But in Linux, colons are okay. I don't recommend it, but you know they're okay. Um, the file name extension is the part that follows a period. You guys have probably learned this in Computer Essentials. At least I hope you have. Um, it helps to describe the content of the file. However, it makes no difference. Linux doesn't care. It doesn't. The extension actually doesn't mean anything under Linux. Um, even under Windows, really, your extension doesn't mean anything. But it tends to pay attention to extensions a lot hint what kind of file it is. Uh, Mac OS is the same. It tends to care, but now they've started doing other stuff to it. Um, but whether you got an extension or not, you can open up any file with any editor. Whether or not it's useful for you is a different story, but you can. Um, a file name that begins with a period. So if I list the contents of this directory, uh, there's four files, two directories. If I do all files, you'll see there's a couple of directories with periods, or files with periods. Dot bash history, dot bash rc, dot profile, dot vim info. And those are, oh, and there's also dot config and dot cache. Those are hidden. The Linux file system ignores them as if they're not even there by the simple fact that there's nothing in front of the period. So in Windows, if you want to hide a file, I don't know if you've actually you've learned how to hide files and un not hide and unhide files, but it's basically a property of the file. You right click on the file, go properties, and there's a checkbox for hidden. And then the file is hidden, unless somebody's got show hidden files turned on. Um, Whenever you're logged in and working command line, you're always assuming, it assumes you're working in the current directory unless you tell it otherwise. That's, you know, you guys have learned that in lab three. So, also in Linux, there's file types. And in Windows, we don't have something like this. We have system files that have been marked as, you know, administrative privileges required, but that's a permission thing. Uh, in Linux, there's actually types. There's a simple and ordinary file. There's a directory. So believe it or not, in Linux, a directory is actually a file. There's no difference between a file and a directory. The only thing is the operating system says these files belong inside that file. And by default, that file now becomes a directory. But there's, it's essentially the same thing. It actually treats it as all the same, which is why it's a little hard to grasp sometimes when you get some questions you'll say, is it a file or a directory? Technically, they're all the files, but a directory contains files. Um, a symbolic link. A symbolic link is a placeholder that points to a uh, file somewhere else on the operating system. Um, you can have a symbolic link to a directory. You can have a link to another file. Um, essentially, these sim links, they're called the we tend to call them sim links, not symbolic links, because you know, we're lazy. We don't want to use the whole phrase. But a sim link 
um, essentially allows it behaves just like a regular directory permissions ownerships all the same but you could theoretically um, have a file with one name that points to a file with a different name often it's used inside the lib directory so you'll have different versions of the same library on the file system and most applications will look for for example libsodium.so libsodium is an encryption library and uh, so if you've got a routine that looks for encryption it'll probably lib use libsodium libsodium obviously has multiple versions well libsodium.so may not even be a real file it could be a symbolic link pointing to a specific version of libsodium on your operating system so they're just pointers. You can actually do the same thing in Windows. Uh, they're called soft links and hard links. Um, they're not very used. Uh, they're actually used on servers more than anywhere else, but you can actually use them on Windows 10 if you want to play with them. Uh, it's a great way to mess up your operating system if you're not careful. But any anything you do, you know, depending on what you do with your operating system, you can mess up. Uh, there's special files such as a device. And then there's named pipes. There's basically a file that has a name and it's a FIFO file, first in, first out. You can send stuff to that named pipe and then an application is reading that file all the time and it's grabbing the input from that file. Or that file or a file could be outputting into there and you could read the contents of that file. A simple ordinary file is used to store information on the disk. You guys know what files are. I hope you know what files are by now. You're level two. Files on Windows, files on Linux, it's all the same thing. It could be a program. It could be source code, graphics, audio, pictures, name it. It could be anything. It's basically a standard file, regular run-of-the-mill file. Um, there's no naming conventions on files, so it's not forced as long as it's standard 255 characters. You can give it any extensions, but they mean nothing, as I said earlier. Um, some programs actually need the extensions and some not. The ones that require extensions tend to be ports that run on multiple operating systems. Uh, directories. It's a named file container within the somewhere under root. It contains the names of files and or directories. Um, the files contained in there are referred to as non-directory files. Uh, link file known as a symbolic link, a soft link, points to an existing file or directory. Um, and you can create it using ln dash s. So for example, in here I've got a file called clock and I've got a file called lab2, one called ls out. So I can go ln dash s And now it created a new file called ls out. As you can see, they actually are describing, if I do a dash l, if you just do it in ls, it'll just look like a file that's a different color than the rest. But when you do a dash l, it shows that ls new points to ls out. So essentially, ls new is ls out. There is no difference whatsoever, <coughs> except for two things. Well, three things. The first thing you'll notice is right here. I've just highlighted an L. It's showing that it's a symbolic link. Um, the next thing you'll notice is the file size. It's five, whatever it is, five bytes. Why? Because all it is is a file that basically contain, points to another file. So you're not doubling the size of the files by creating, so no, you're making, not making a copy. You're basically, I can't use this word, but basically you're making a shortcut to that. So it's not really a shortcut, but people understand concepts of shortcuts. You're basically, it's a redirect to that file. So if I go, so I did vim ls out. You can see the content here. I'm going to go and delete 25 lines. Now, if I go, 
you'll see it's the same file. I just opened up via the symlink instead of the actual file, and you can see the contents changed. It's a cute trick. It's uh, really handy for a lot of stuff. Um, another common use is uh, for web servers. For example, your um, your WAMP, so your computer, say, has two drives in it, a big drive and a small drive. A small drive that's really fast and a big drive that's really slow. But you, whatever software you have that insists on installing, insists on installing on C. You could theoretically create a symlink to there. So on web servers, often what happens is um, you'll have a, dra a dedicated drive with its own partition for the web server files, like your actual websites. And under the actual var triple w, there'll be a bunch of symlinks pointing to the contents of that directory. Why would you want to do that? That way, um, it separates it out, and theoretically, you give different permissions to access those files, which is good, especially in a hosted environment. Uh, you could have all the web server files contained on that drive as part of a RAID array, but the main operating system is not. Why put the main operating system on a RAID array when you don't need it to be? Um, I just described, I just de demonstrated what happened with the first point here. Um, if you get rid of the old file, all right, so I created another one just for demonstration purposes. If I go now you'll notice something just happened. The sim link at the bottom turned red. It's because it's no longer valid. The file no longer exists. It's gone. Um, on the other hand, if I go So right now we got ls out new, going to point at ls out. If I get rid of the sim link, you'll see that the original ls out is still there, but the sim link is gone. So if you delete a file a sim link is pointing to, you've broken the sim link. It still exists. Uh, but if you delete the sim link, it doesn't modify anything else. It just gets rid of the sim link. So that's a symbolic link. What it does, it points from one file to another using a file name and a path. A hard link is a connection between the file name and the inode number. So that means that you could actually move that file elsewhere and it will keep following the inode. So the file is hard linked. And to create a hard link, it's ln without any arguments. So instead of dash s, you just do ln old name, new name, and suddenly poof. You got a hard link. Um, a single file can have any number of hard links. The hard links provide different file names for the same physical file. So theoretically, you could have one file and you have multiple names for it. It all points to that same file. Um, if you make any changes either, the effect applies everywhere. The same thing as with the sim link. Um, the difference is, though, between a soft link, a sim link, and a hard link is with a sim link, if you rename either file, uh, things happen. If you rename the sim link, nothing happens. But if you rename the originating file, the sim link is broken. With a hard link, you can rename either file and the link never breaks because it's not it has nothing to do with the file name. It's to the file identifier instead. So, you know, in Linux, not in Linux, but in database, for example, and you did update user where username is equal to Dan. And you change, you know, and then you can make the update. But then you go update user where username is equal to Dan, but somewhere along the way you renamed Dan. You can't do the update anymore because it doesn't work because that record is not find, findable. But if you're doing it by primary key, update user where user ID is 5, 
Who cares what the username is? As long as you're pointing to five, it's the same idea. Um, you can copy sim links and hard links using CP. Uh, if you want to copy a sim a soft link, it's dash D. If you want to copy a hard link, it's dash L. Uh, special file, also known as a device. It's a way of accessing the hard drive and the processes. Uh, each hardware device is associated with at least one special file. Uh, most of them are contained under slash dev. There's a few common ones in there. Uh, slash dev slash CD-ROM. I'll give you three guesses what that's pointing to. Your CD-ROM drive. Um, FDN, floppy drives. Don't worry about it. None of our computers have them anymore. But it used to be a really common thing. Slash dev slash FD1, FD0, FD3. Because computers used to have more than one floppy drive. Um, HD. And then there's two characters. Those are for non-SCSI type drives. So the thing is, is most drives nowadays identify as SCSI. The serial ATA drives that we all have in our computers show up as SCSI drives. Um, but it used to be it was HD. So you'd have HD, and then the first character would be the drive number. The next one would be the partition. The drive number would be a letter, so it would be HDA. Zero would be the first partition on drive A. If you had HDB, so you had two hard drives in your computer, HDB would be the second hard drive, HDC would be the third hard drive, on and on. Um, they can be character devices and block devices. Um, character devices allow you to transmit stuff character by character. These would be serial ports, serial devices. You could connect with a modem and then start copying text files into the modem. It would actually transmit them one letter at a time. Or if you had a line printer hooked up via a serial port, you could cat the content of a file to the line printer and the printer would print whatever is being sent to it. That was kind of cool. Uh, block devices. Transfers memory buffers. So it's much faster than character devices. These tend to be hard drives. Um, Another type of device you might find under there is input devices, such as your mouse, your keyboard, that kind of stuff. Uh, character devices. Believe it or not, your mouse is considered to be a character device. Uh, TTY1, serial, that's the old t teletype port 1, also known as serial port 1. Uh, LP0 would be your parallel port printer. 0 would mean, you know, the first one. It always starts at 0. Block devices would be hard drives, so HDA, SDA, that kind of stuff. Oh, and now we get into the meat and potatoes. So, we're doing pretty good. Um, Partitions. You guys should know what partitions are if you took Computer Essentials. How many out of the couple of extras that have shown up remember what a partition is? One. Anybody else remember what a partition is? Two. Good. Three. Four. Good. So most of you do. A partition is a division of a hard drive. The problem is that often it's taught like it's a pie chart. When people think, I know, it's a hard drive. And my this partition occupies 25%, and the rest of it is 75%. It's really not how it works, right? You, you realize that. Hard drives are linear. This is one partition. This is another partition. And then there's block addresses. So that's cylinder 0. That could be cylinder 350. 54,000, whatever. So partitions are identified by a drive letter. And this actually applies to HD also. So there's SD and HD. HD is the old parallel, the old uh, PADA drives. Parallel. Remember the old hard drives that had the really wide connectors for those of us at a certain age or a certain vintage? Hard drives had these wide connectors. Those were known as parallel drives. New hard drives have the tiny little connectors, and they're known as serial SATA drives. 
or there's also um, SAS drives and the old SCSI drives. Those are all serial drives, small connector because the, the drives are daisy chained as serial devices. That's why they're called SD, serial drive. The other ones were known as hard drive. Go figure. So it always comes in with SD followed by a drive letter, drive letter and then a partition number. So it would go SD 1 to 4 because any given operating system, Linux allows four primary partitions per disk. And there's choices for logical drives, and you can have a total of 64 partitions on a drive, including your logical ones. So if you had a hard drive, and you have two hard drives, and your, your second hard drive, first partition would be slash dev slash sdb1. And second partition would be sdb2, sdb3, sdb4. So as I just said, the note at the end, four primary partitions. Um, you can have up to four primary partitions or three primaries and an extended. The extended contains all the others. Uh, this is leftovers back in the day when operating systems had big limitations of how big partitions could be, how big the partition tables could be. Here's a sample diagram. And as I just described, you can have three primaries and a, an extended, or four primaries and no extended. That's your choices. And the extended partition basically That's not time to call me. Um, and as I was saying, the extended partition is just like a, basically a room that's been subdivided. It creates a special partition table inside itself. Partitioning um, is basically breaking down drive into its component into smaller pieces. A master boot sector contains the partition table. Um, did you guys learn that in Computer Essentials? Sort of, vaguely, I hope. A little bit and then moved on to something else. Um, so a file system has a special sector called the master boot sector. And it's basically a part of the hard drive that's been reserved. And nobody's allowed to use this area. And it used to be the most common source for hard drive corruption was the master boot sector would get corrupted. It also used to be the most popular spot for viruses to install themselves. They'd actually put themselves inside the master boot sector, which was outside the operating system's capability of reaching. And the only way to get away from those viruses was to actually format the whole drive. And even then, you actually had to do a low-level format, which avoided your warranty. Um, so that's what the master boot sector is. It contains a disk partition table. And it defines four entries, which is, as I demonstrated, I showed just the slide before. There's four directory, uh, four partitions you can create, either four primaries or at least one primary and a bunch of other extendeds if you wanted. Um, each this partition table contains specific items, and they are the following things: the first cylinder, the last cylinder. So. Where does it start? Where does it end? It doesn't care about the size of the drive. It just cares about how many sectors it has available to it. Um, whether it's a bootable, so it's just a flag that says this partition can be used to boot. This is like every computer. It's, it has nothing to do with Windows, Linux, Unix. The master boot sector is the same for all operating systems. Essentially, it uses the same area. Windows has recently changed how that works. Go figure. <coughs> and then there's a file system type identifier. So there is a number that identifies the first cylinder. There's a number that identifies the last cylinder. Then there's a single bit, true or false. Is it bootable? And then there's a number that identifies what kind of file system it is. Um, just going to call the partition table DPT for the moment. Uh, a single partition can either be a primary partition or an extended partition. You can only have one extended partition, um, at least with Linux. 
and Windows. Uh, there are a few op other operating systems and disk formats that allow more than one of those, but that's the most common. Um, the first partition is always called the primary partition. Um, strangely enough, if you were actually to open up your disks using in Windows using your disk manager, you'd see that the first partition is not your C drive. It's another reserved area, but it's still considered a primary partition. Um, one of the four partitions would be an extended partition. We already discussed that. Uh, that allows you to create subpartitions. So it's like having a big room and then putting up uh, dividers and separating up that big room. And that last point I've already covered multiple times. Now, Linux requires two partitions to successfully work. It needs a root partition because if you don't have your root partition, you don't have an OS. Uh, it's a primary requirement. The kernel and the OS have to be in there. Um, there can only be one root operating system. It can be ext2, ext3, ext4. These are backwards compatible but not forwards compatible. That means a ext4 file system will work with ext2 tools, but ext2 tools can't work with ext4. Uh, there are actually a few new uh, file systems you can use outside of these, but it's recommended that you stick to one of those. There's no big real limitation how big this partition can be. You can make it occupy the whole disk. And the cool thing is it's not like back in the days, in the old DOS days, where a partition could only be so many megabytes. Literally, you can have a Linux partition that occupies the entire drive. It, it doesn't care. Um, depending how much the size of it depends on what you plan to put in there, obviously. So make sure you give yourself lots of room. The other partition is known as the swap partition. This partition is not accessible by a user. Um, usually, you look at how much RAM you have in your computer, multiply by two or three. And that's what the size of your swap partition should be. Uh, there's a specific file system type called Linux Swap. It's used for virtual memory. Um, in Windows, there are a couple of files. There is a file that does the same thing. It's called the swap file. It's a hidden file that you can't see. Even if you have hidden files turned on, you still can't see it. Uh, it's, it's a hidden system file. If you turn on all the flags, eventually you can see it and then corrupt your system. Uh, if you try to delete it while it's in use, bad things will happen. Uh, it's like you're ripping out a RAM stick out of your machine while the operating system's running, essentially. Um, Linux uses an actual dedicated partition for that job instead, so you can't accidentally nuke it. Um, it's not, it can't see this amount of partition. But the kernel knows it's there because it looks at the disk when it boots up. It uh, pulls the computer for all the disks, asks where are all your partitions, and then it finds the applicable partition. Um, you can have up to 64 swap partitions mounted at any given time. So you could actually have your virtual memory spread across multiple drives for performance reasons. Uh, there's a command called free. It tells you how much swap space you've got. Okay. I told it to be human readable. That's what the dash H does. Um, it shows that I've got 1.2 gigs of memory available. 1.9 gigs of memory available, 164 are used, 850 megs free, 8.1 megs are shared. Uh, that's the memory um, that's been allocated. Th this is running in a VM. For a second, my brain took a brain fart and I said, wow, I got 32 gigs. What the hell's wrong? I forgot my VM only has 2 gigs of RAM. If I was running on my computer, that first number would be 32 gig, not 1.9 gig. And then it shows the swap being 974 megs. None of it is used. Why? Because I'm not running anything on this VM other than command line. So it hasn't needed to reach into needing more memory. So basically the swap space is used in case you run out of RAM. It takes the contents and copies it to the disk. All right, ext2 file system. EXT2 stands for Second Extend File System. It was came around in 1993. Um, it was created to have get over some of the issues of the original Extend File System. Um, it cannot journal, so I'll explain what journaling is in a minute. 
Um, on a flash drive, USB drive, and if you don't want it to be Windows readable, you use the XT2. It doesn't need any extra overhead. Um, maximum file size can be anywhere from 16 gigs to 2 terabytes, depending on the size of your drive. Um, the XT2 file system can go from anywhere from 2 terabytes to 32 terabytes. So, lots of room. The XT3 came around in 2001. This is probably one of the most recent technologies you're going to be using in, in computing, believe it or not. Uh, it stands for Third Extended File System. It's shipped with kernel 2.4. It allows journaling. Journaling allows for more safety, higher security rules, more tracking of changes, um, easier recovery. So what happens is it keeps track of all the changes you're doing to the files on the operating system, and it marks them and so that if your computer were to lose power suddenly, it would read the rest of the journal and finish applying the changes. Um, it has a dedicated area in the file system where all the changes are tracked. Um, so what happens is any changes you're writing to the file system, it writes them into this dedicated area. And then there's a process in the background that finishes applying the changes to the file system so that your, app, your application can save quickly because it dumps into the journaled area and the journal picks up the changes and starts writing them. So if something goes wrong, the changes that are contained in the journal are still there. Um, as you can see, the file size limitations are the same. Uh, you can convert from 2 to 3. You don't need to do anything special to it. Uh, EXT4, take a guess, stands for fourth extended file system. Brought around in 2008. Needed kernel 2.619 is when it started being available. One of the big perks of 4 over 3 is the file sizes can be massive now. Um, a single file can be 16 gigs to 16 terabytes. You know, that's a, you know, we don't, you, most consumer hard drives don't even reach 16 terabytes. So it gives you an idea how big, it's designed for enterprise. Um, overall maximum file, si file system size is one exabyte. So just so you know, an exabyte is equal to 1,024 petabytes. A petabyte's 1,024 terabytes. So my laptop's got two one terabyte drives. So it's as if I take one of those drives, have it 1,024 times, and then take that number and do it 1,024 times again. So whatever that number is, it's not 2,048. It's, you know, a lot more. Um, each directory can have 64,000 subdirectories. EXT3 allows only 32,000 subdirectories. So one directory can hold 32,000 directories. And each of those directories can hold 32,000 directories. It's a little excessive. Um, it's literally now, it's reached the point where these numbers are basically points on a slideshow like it is today. <laughs> Look, we can do this, Mom. Uh, you can go EXT3 to 4 without having to upgrade it. You just hit a, you just run a command and magically your 3 becomes 4. And you can suddenly get access to all the extra stuff. It's magic. Um, it's faster than EXT3. It's more reliable than EXT3 because they improved how some of the stuff works. Um, and EXT4, you have the option to turn journaling off. So let's say you have a small partition that really doesn't do much and you don't need that extra overhead running. You can just say, this partition or this drive, you don't need journaling but you still have access to big honking files. Now, Linux by out of the box can read the following operating syst uh, file systems. EXT, XT2, XT3, XT4, MS-DOS, VFAT, also known as FAT32. So you know when you plug in a flash drive and it gives you the choice to format it FAT32? That's what that is. Um, NFS, which is Network File System, allows you to mount files directly from over the network, but it treats it as a special file system type. And NTFS, and it gives you an idea how old these slides are. I'll show you how things really haven't changed that much. Because it says about Windows NT 2000 and XP. You can throw in Vista, Windows 8, Windows 7, and Windows 10 in there for the ride. Um, I really got to make fun of the guy who updated these slides last. A couple more operating systems it can handle. HPFS. Those of us of a certain vintage remember OS2. Maybe you never played with OS2. But odds are at least a quarter of the ATMs out there are still running OS2. It's just not called OS2 anymore. Um, 
OS2 is an operating system created by IBM in partnership with Microsoft. And then they had a falling out. And half of OS2 is inside Windows NT. So when we're running Windows 10, there's actually parts of OS2 inside of it. And vice versa. And OS2 actually was significantly superior to Windows 3.1 at the time. Um, it just didn't go anywhere because IBM said it wasn't worth their time to try to, feed, to fight against Microsoft for operating systems. Uh, ISO 9660, CD-ROMs. All CD-ROMs pretty much are ISO 9660. Uh, SysV, um, that's the Unix file system that's most common. That's the one, uh, there's a AT&T, AT &T, those of you who remember what those letters are. For those of you under a certain age, at and was a big telecom company in the States. Huge, like Bell in Canada or Rogers, actually bigger, because they probably could have could have bought Bell with a check at one point. Um, and they were actually one of the founding companies behind Unix, where, you know, way back in the day. And they have an operating system called System 5. HFS, that's Apple Macintosh, not Mac OS X, like the original Mac OS. Uh, QNIX 4, um, you know, QNIX? Bought by BlackBerry? Eh? Yeah, they're still in Canada. Uh, one of the most popular infotainment operating systems because it's a real-time OS. Uh, in other words, an OS that doesn't have a crash ever. Even if it crashes, it knows how to fix itself and come back from the dead. Um, QNX4 partitions. NCPFS, those are the old Novell file servers. Those don't even exist anymore, but they're there. And there's literally they're adding new file systems every day. Or every time they come up with a new one, they add it to the pile. In Linux, we have the fdisk command. Windows used to have fdisk. They took it away. We now have something called disk part instead. Uh, disk part's 10 times harder to use than fdisk. Go figure. And fdisk allows you to manipulate your partitions. So if I did So that's fdisk-l slash dev slash sda. That's something you guys can all run inside your VMs, and it's in the slide. It outputs information about the file tables on that operating system. As you can see, it's got um, three partitions. There's a primary partition, an extended partition, and a swap partition. And You'll see to the right here, you have a couple of numbers. 83 is the, yeah, basically the Linux file system. Uh, 5 identifies an extended partition. 82 is the Linux swap, but you'll notice it has slash Solaris. Solaris is an old Unix operating system that's been around for a long time. It's still around. Uh, it was run, owned by Sun, and then Sun was bought by Oracle, and then Sun disappeared. Um, then their operating system shared the same file system ID. Now, fdisk has two menu levels, general functions. So if you just call up fdisk, that's what comes up first. And all the basic stuff you need to be able to manipulate partitions, creating partitions, deleting partitions, modifying partitions, it's all there. Uh, and there's also advanced functionality. Uh, you can change uh, the partition type. Um, so, for example, I could take a swap partition and change it into a Linux partition. And suddenly, whoop, I can mount it and vice versa. Um, this is one of the big reasons why we have you guys run Linux in a VM. Is when you start playing with FDisk, you can corrupt your OS. And that's why we had you clone your, your VM at the start of the term so you have a backup. Because FDisk can really pooch your, your operating system because you can just delete partitions and then your computer doesn't know how to boot anymore. Um, when I got my very first computer, I didn't know what the FDisk command was and I didn't know what partitions were. And I learned how to install DOS and Windows on the second day of owning a computer. Because I was going through the MS-DOS manual and I was wondering what these things were. So I ran the commands. Uh, FDisk is really dangerous. Um, there's a few steps you can follow to create a usable file system. The first step is you have to prepare the drive. 
And believe it or not, this, these, this kind of stuff might show up on a test or an exam. Uh, step one, prepare the drive, also known as creating partitions. If you have an empty drive, you can't do anything with it because it, there's no partitions to contain your files. So you prep the drive, create, create a partition. Step two, you've created a partition. So now you've created a, an empty space. So I decided to create a partition here. This partition currently is empty. It's as empty as a teenager's head. There's nothing there, nothing going on. And inside that space, uh, there's nothing. So what you have to do is you have to create a file system. So suddenly, you're giving structure to what's in here. So now that there's a file system in here, you now are able to um, basically put in files. And there's a command called MKFS. You guys have learned about MKDIR, make a directory. There's one called MKFS. And there's uh, tons of options on MKFS. Uh, but the most important one would be dash T, telling it the type, ext3. So basically, put it tells it to create a partition there, type ext3. And then you give it the partition number you're after. After you've created your partition, and you've created a file system, you really should make sure it's all good. So there's a command called fsck, um, file system check. You gotta be careful when you read it because it looks like a different word. And you'll see a lot of people think they're funny with applicable shirts. Um, but they're not funny. So fsck, you tell what kind of operate the file system type it is, and you give it the partition, and then it goes and it you know, double checks, make sure everything's kosher and everything's good. You're good to continue. If there's problems, it'll fix them. Uh, if you're having problems at this stage and you just created a fresh partition and a fresh file system and you got corruption, you probably have a bad drive. So, you know, it's important to do this check just to make sure everything's good. Uh, the next step is you mount it. For example, in Windows, you plug in a flash drive. It gets a drive letter. Guess what just happened? Windows mounted the partition on that flash drive. Uh, anybody here, out of the, you know, audience of six, ever put in a new hard drive in your computer? Right? So one. And then you created a partition. Depending on how you did it, you don't get a drive letter right away. Then you format it, and then suddenly, whoop, Windows says, oh, look, I got a drive. I want a letter for it. And then it assigns a letter. It's mounting the file, that file system to a drive letter. In Linux, it mounts it to a directory instead. Um, so you're going to mount it. And that's if you don't want to, but the cool part about Linux is you can have drives or partitions, and if it's not defined in a file called fstab, they don't get mounted right away, so they're basically invisible drives until you mount it. So you can have entire partitions on your computer that you never see until you want to see it. Uh, fstab has, is a file that, that tells the operating system, see these file systems? You must mount these. I don't know why it's called fstab. I know fs stands for file system tab. Do you guess as good as mine? Um, there's a few other ones. Instead of MKFS, there's also MKSwap. Creates the swap partitions and makes it available. Uh, swap on and swap off. Basically, it says, hey, you can use this partition for swap space, or no, don't use this partition for swap space. It's not that complicated. Um, <laughs> shoot, I just finished discussing that. So in Windows, you want a partition, you get a drive letter. So performance is traded off for user experience or user convenience. You plug in a flash drive, it gets mounted right away. Congratulations. It's available. In Linux, it mounts the file systems only when it needs them or if you've needed them. Um, and then, but it's not always convenient for the end users. Thus, you're losing convenience for performance. If in Windows, the problem is when it boots, and those of us past a certain age maybe remember having two or three hard drives in their computer, Windows takes longer to boot the more drives and partitions you have because it needs to check. It does a quick check to make sure they're all good. In Linux, it mounts only the file systems it needs, so it never even checks these other partitions until it needs to touch them. Um, yeah, we, we discussed this already. Um, certain storage areas always exist. 
You can use disk management to create new partitions, sign drive letters, st um, format drives, that kind of stuff. Uh, in Linux, the command is called mount. Um, once it's mounted, you can use it until you turn off the computer, unless you unmount it. Um, a mount point is a directory. In other words, essentially you create a directory somewhere and you mount a file system to it and it's as if you can just go CD into that directory and now you're on that other disk or in that other partition. It's indistinguishable from any other directory on the, on the, on the computer. Linux doesn't care. A directory is a directory, a directory is a partition, it's the same thing as far as it's concerned. Uh, there's a directory called MNT, it's a generic mount point, almost never used. Um, like I said, they can be mounted manually. You can list them in FS tab. Actually, I'll show you guys the contents of that. Maybe I'll try this instead so it's color coded. All right. So there's the contents of my FS tab. Actually, yours should look almost exactly the same. Um, there's a UUID. The difference is sometimes that's not that'll be a partition instead of UUID. The next thing is where does it mount? The next thing is what operating system it is, and then what to do with extra arguments. So could be on if there's never mount remount read only, and then um, mount and pass. So those on path zero, path one. When the Linux operating system boots, it actually looks at the drives in multiple passes, and you can tell it which one should be mounted first. It's kind of handy. So here's an example of the single root directory structure with multiple disks and some multiple mount points. You have your root operating system on HDA1. You could have the boot partition under HDA2, which was a common wave. Remember I said that earlier, where used in the day you'd put your boot directory on a separate partition? So you'd make your original boot directory ext2, and then the rest of your operating system the ext3 or 4, or something else. Um, in this case, etc is still on the main root partition on drive A. Uh, under mount, you could have floppy and CD-ROM. And HDA5 could be Windows, so if you have a multi-boot operating system, you could have you know, multiple drives, multiple partitions. All right. That's the end of that slideshow. Um, there's not much else to that because it's almost a reference for file systems and partitions for Linux. Um, pretty much everything you need to understand for Lab 5 is in that. So if you watch the video, you're ready to go for Lab 5. Or you rewatch the video or you rewatch the slides. I'm gonna make sure that this version of the slideshow is on Brightspace as soon as I you know wrap up. Um, once again, as a reminder, midterms after the break. Now, not today. Because I would suck. Six people writing the midterm. I should have done it anyways. Um, but that would have just be mean. Um, yeah, so right now you have no lab work this week assigned, uh, because they're supposed to be the midterm week, so there's no labs assigned. Uh, you do have labs next week, uh, not next week, the week after. So after the break, you're going diving to lab five. Presentation was for today for it, so we're actually running at the right pace now where the labs are coming after the lectures, which is good. Other than that, thanks for the six that came out. Thanks to the weather, it was small attendance, but that's okay. And I'll, uh, if anybody's got lab tonight, I'll see you tonight. Uh, otherwise, um, I might see some of you tomorrow.